Welcome to No Filter HD, Episode 90. Ballistic Coffee Boy here, your host. This time, guys, we're going to take a look at Llamasoft, the Jeff Mentor story by Digital Eclipse. And this is an interactive documentary, the second in the Goldmaster series, The Last Vein Karateka. Of course, Digital Eclipse did Atari 50, which is my game of the year for, uh, was it last year? Year before? Uh, but just fantastic. Uh, I freaking love this. So I'm going to be going through every chapter in this with you. Uh, in association, sorry, in association with the Heart of Neon documentary, of course, uh, I interviewed that director Paul Doherty on my channel. Check it out. And the musician Tony Longworth, who is a good friend of mine. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Now, I was given a free copy of this to review, uh, which is amazing. It says here, if you load up one of my games and see a big camel or whatever, you'll know immediately who created it. I've always tried to put a bit of myself into my games, Jeff Mentor. He writes them to play them, Llamasoft Advertisement. And I cannot wait to dig into this, you guys. Uh, now, full disclosure, this is my second time going through this. I had some audio issues, so you won't see the chapters being unlocked, as it were, until next time. But um, I had a severe echoing going on, um, so I'm redoing this for you. But this is just a fantastic documentary, uh, uh, interactive documentary. I am a huge Jeff Mentor fan. I love uh, many of his games, so I'm so excited to dig in. So it says here, the last indie developer for over 40 years, Jeff Mentor has created games his own way. Explore the history of Llamasoft below or jump into Jeff's games anytime by pressing Y. Chapter 1, The Early Years. A young university dropout finds success bringing authentic arcade action of Britain's first home computers. And as you see, it's been explored 100% because I have gone through this, but I didn't want to have echoing audio throughout the whole thing so i had to redo this uh, but definitely worth it so next time we'll be taking a look at chapter two the hairy years chapter three the light fantastic and chapter four the tempest uh, so i am stoked to dig into this let's go right ahead so it says the llama takes flight and the memories of the british gaming scene of the 1980s no name looms as large as jeff mentor a self-taught coder with an innate feel for what made video games fun, Jeff wanted to bring the arcade action he loved to the home computers of the UK. Just fantastic. Um, cannot wait, as I said, to get started. It says here, L -l liftoff. <laughs> Very cool. That's the end of this chapter. But let's go ahead and go to the next part. Introduction, Je uh, meet Jeff Mentor. A fiercely independent designer with a lifelong love for pure gameplay, Jeff Mentor has cut his own distinctive path through the video game industry, becoming a cult figure with a devoted fan base. And let's take a look at this video. I can't think of Jeff Minter without the word legend in my head. He's been around the industry for many years and still makes powerful games that have influenced a great number of people. I always found Jeff and his games fascinating because, you know, Jeff was so distinct and it's just, like, just so unlike anyone else. And it's one of the true, like, originals, like, one of the true iconoclasts in gaming. Like, there's no one else like him. Like, if Jeff didn't exist, you'd have to invent him, right? Because someone has to, someone has to be that guy. There aren't enough people like Jeff. He is in his things. What, it, what he makes is him. What, what makes Jeff stand out, and, and, and what for me was the whole point of, of um, the artistry when I was younger, was this notion that it's, it's, a, it's you in the thing. It is an extension of you. 
It is a part of you. It is part of your character, your personality. Vordy's making is stuff he makes out of love, and that's always been present in everything that he does. I think that's just one of the things that makes the games lovely, that makes the, the games are so integral to Jeff, and Jeff is so integral to the games. Obviously, I was a big fan of Jeff from the 80s. Uh, I think he was one of the main reasons I got to Commodore 64 after having a Spectrum. After seeing, I think, Sheep in Space and Revenge of the Mutant Camels, I thought, oh, hello. This is interesting. It was this lifestyle, cultural choice that he'd made, which was so different to everyone else. Everyone else was just a company or a product, and Jeff was Jeff. He was in magazines talking about his life. He was talking about what interests him, what was different about the way he approached it. He was engaging with people directly, and Jeff was passionate about the art of making games, being himself, and if people like to pay him money to do that, fantastic. The way he dressed, he looked a bit rock starish and, and hippie-ish as well. He had long hair and a beard and he dressed a bit like a hippie, I suppose, um, which I could relate to because in the 70s I grew my hair long. But well, we weren't called, well, we were known as hairies then. He always had those Peruvian jumpers and the, you know, the animals in there, oh yeah. And the long hair and the, oh yeah, here he is. Here's the hippie. <laughs> He had like an Afghan coat, well, sheepskin on the outside and the, the fluff down the front. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I remember that. Very different from the other programmers that we met at those times. Very, very different. It's somewhere between being very rock star and not rock star at all. I can't quite decide <laughs> because he will just dress how he likes and, and, and talk, speak his mind and he's very lovely and very open to speaking with everyone. and. It, it is very interesting to see someone who's never really fallen into the trap of wanting to conform to what the industry thinks anyone should be. Jeff's always just made peace, I think, with living in the sideline. He's never given up on game design as a discipline, as a, as a vocation. It's all very much work, but it is like, you know, this, this kind of peaceful kind of compromise between like this is going to be the work but I'm only going to agree to do this amount of work for something that I really love. Kind of a bit tempesty when we're going into a tube. I do like the tube shooters. I've been lucky that I was so far in my career I've always managed to work on stuff that I want to do and I guess I just stubbornly want to carry on doing that really. I don't want to sort of compromise that in order to potentially make more money or whatever. I'd say I'm definitely off mainstream. I have kind of a tangential connection to the traditional game dev scene I think. I, I want to enjoy what I do, I want to feel happy with the things that I've made and I want to make things that I want to play with. Awesome guys, these are going to be some great videos, I just can't wait, um, so very cool. It says, Tadley, a small English town about 90 minutes from London by car, Tadley is perhaps best known for its centuries old tradition of making classic besom style brooms. In fact, Tadley brooms can be seen in several Harry Potter movies. It was also the original home of Jeff Minter's company, Llamasoft. So I'm going to zoom into these, uh, and as you know uh, from the last video, I'm going to put on the captions in case people have a hard time understanding English accents, I don't. But uh, just in case, Atomic Weapons Research Establishment. The town of Tadley is known for being situated on the border of the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment, the facility in which the United Kingdom designed and manufactured nuclear warheads. Tadley greatly expanded in the 50s and 60s to provide housing for the AWRE employees, one of whom was Patrick Mentor, Jeff's father. Now let's take a look at this establishment. I'll try to take away the captions so you can see it a little bit better. Awesome. So definitely maybe influential to him. 
It says, Behind the wire, was this odd juxtaposition of a nuclear facility on the border of a sleepy traditional English town what subconsciously inspired Jeff to create games that blasted rural farm animals into all-out space wars? Perhaps. But a more concrete inspiration came from the fact that the children of AWRE employees could go behind the wire, entering the facility to play RK games at its recreational society. Minterviews. It was never entirely quiet in our town, even in the dead of night. The AWRE emitted a steady background industrial rumble at all times, and you could lie in bed at night and listen to the tickering of the criticality alarms guarding the reactors. Wow. Definitely probably had an impact, right? High scores. The RK games of the late 70s were catnip to young Jeff. Whenever he could get his hands on them, the AWRE, bars in bigger cities, traveling fairs, anywhere, he'd be dropping in a spare change to play Breakout, Space Evaders, and whatever else was available. Minterviews. There was nothing in my brain that connected video games to computers. Games were just flat boxes that someone had built to do the things they wanted to do by way of some kind of incomprehensible magic. And computers were things that sent you your gas bill. Love it. Commodore Pet. Commodore released its first personal computer, the Pet, in December 1977. Based on the MOS 6502 processor, the same one used in the Atari video computer system released that year, the Pet was one of the first wave of PCs that began to introduce computers into the home. It had many cost-saving features built, uh, but were still quite expensive for most families of the time. Learning the basics. When Jeff was 16, he went to Sixth Form College, the UK's equivalent of the junior year of high school in the US. It was there he first came across a student playing a game on a Commodore PET, who told him that he had typed the programming and using the basic programming language. Jeff immediately borrowed a book on basic from the college library and began learning how he might create games on the school's PET, or PET. Very cool. Minterviews. My brother had a TI-59 programmable calculator that came with a booklet of example programs. I flipped through the calculator programs to find something that looked simple and sat down to write and bureau on a bit of paper, my first bit of proper code, porting a biorhythm program from a calculator language that I'd never used to a computer language that I'd never used. Jeff's School Notebook. A look into Jeff's notebook from Sixth Form College, circa 79, includes some of his first notes about basic programming language as well as machine code, as well as an illustrated glimpse into his musical tastes. I love these notebooks. Look at this. So feel free to zoom in on this. I will not spend too long on these uh, pictures, but you can pause at any time and read them and look at them if you'd like. And again, I want to say how grateful I am to Digital Clips for sending me this copy to review uh just I, i'm just blown away by this it's just an awesome uh documentary i just love it first flight the first game jeffrey calls creating on the pet was an outer space action game loosely and unofficially based on the star trek tv series graphics were entirely shown with text characters with the player's ship represented by a playing card club symbol and laser beams made up of lines and slashes the original game is lost this screenshot is a recreation Deflex. As Jeff and his school friends learn more and more about how the Commodore Pet worked, they created more complex games. One was called Deflex, in which the player had to control the path of a bouncing ball by placing paddles that would reflect it at a 90 degree angle. Jeff would remake Deflex many times, first as an early Llamasoft release and eventually for iOS devices in 2011. The original PET version is lost and this is a recreation. Interviews. I had discovered the existence of Screen RAM and in doing so taken my first step towards real understanding of how the machine really worked and away from the limitations of BASIC. We were becoming machine specific. Starfire. Jeff's magnum opus on the college's Commodore Pet was Starfire, which was loosely based on the 70 arcade cabinet of the same name by Exidy, which was itself loosely based on the space dogfight scenes of the Star Wars films. It mimicked the arcade game's first-person cockpit view, but still needed to use the pet's text characters for its graphics. (laughs) 
interviews. Simple though it was, Exidy Starfire was one of the first ever games that I found to be truly immersive. Sitting in that cockpit with that large color screen filling my field of view, it felt for a while like looking out of a craft instead of merely remote piloting one from above, as was the norm in most other games. Starfire Manual. Here's the handwritten instruction manual for Jeff's version of Starfire. Uh, a now this looks just like the Star Wars logo, right? <laughs> uh, feel free to zoom in on this. I will not, or and pause and read it. I won't stop too long on this for time's sake, but very cool. Sir Clive's computer. In early 1980, British investor Clive Sinclair, 1940 to 2021, introduced the ZX80, the first computer on the UK market that cost less than 100 pounds. While its capabilities were extremely limited, the ZX80's very low cost put computer ownership within reach of the average family, and it was widely popular. For his efforts, Sinclair was knighted by the Queen in 1983. A very important figure. At last, nearly two years after I'd first set eyes on a computer, there was a real chance that I could get one of my own. The idea of having your own machine that you could use exclusively and never have to worry about the next person shoving you off to claim your time slot was tremendously exciting. I don't think I keenly anticipated a purchase so much in my life. ZX80. The limited nature of the ZX80 made it a difficult platform for game programming, but that didn't stop Jeff from continuing to learn the ins and outs of the system. Around this time, he started studying physics at the University of East Anglia, but was far more interested in the ZX80 and failed out of school after one year. Look at these old computers. I love these. ZX81, the successor to the ZX80, released as the Timex Sinclair 1000 in the US, was still a low-powered, low-cost machine, but it was enough of an upgrade that Jeff could finally get action games to run. In quick succession, he produced a version of Deflex, a pseudo-3D maze game called 3D 3D, and an unofficial version of the latest, hottest arcade game of 1981, Atari's Centipede. I was actually using one of these a week or two ago at a friend's house. <laughs> so cool. 3D 3D. Of 3D 3D, Jeff says that while the idea of it was quite cool, the maze was a cube and you could go through holes in the floor and ceiling as well as left and right, the slow speed rendered it pretty much impossible to play by creatures with metabolisms that run on a normal human time scale. <laughs> I love his sense of humor. Let's take a look at this cassette. I love how you can flip these around and see them in quasi 3D. That's just amazing. I love that. So let's go ahead and play this one. Of course, these are ranked by llamas. This is two out of five llamas, 81 on the ZX81. A maze game with a pseudo 3D first person perspective. The title 3D3 refers to the fact that the maze is a cube and players can climb up and down through its layers. This is an early llama soft release programmed in basic and this was not on the market for very long. Um, and of course, these, these initial older games uh, don't have um, sound. So we'll talk through some of this. But, um, and these, uh, most of his games here in this chapter, in a way, come with instruction manuals on screen, so I will leave this up for you to read if you would like. The program presents the maze in a form of a cube 11 by 11 by 11. You're placed on the lowest level. A 3D view of your surroundings is generated and displayed along with your X, Y, and Z coordinates and your orientation. So, uh, pretty neat. Uh, so, this is unique and being the only program. Uh, like this at the time. A score is generated by counting your steps and adding various penalties for map reading. You uh, may map read by pressing question mark instead of an orientation or a motion command. Now, this is using the controller on this, so keep that in mind. So, um, there are direction keys here. Remember, orientation is absolute. If you face right and the screen shows turnings on the left side of the screen, you look forward, not left, if you look, um, if you choose to look in. So, uh, pretty neat. So uh, let's see. To move, pressing new line moves you one step in the direction of your current orientation. Please note to look in, um, to look into or enter a turning, you move towards it until it just disappears. Um, okay, I'll leave this on the screen and let's go ahead and start. So uh, yeah, so so pretty much a maze, um, and you can see see the, there are little corridors here and there that actually turn. So you want to turn in those directions. Um, now, as I said in the beginning, this is the second time I played through chapter one. So, um, doing a lot better this time. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, see the corridor right there. You want to make a left and turn left to go down that way. So kind of cool, just like a maze and, uh, definitely, uh, some nice building blocks here for young Jeff mentor, uh, for what was to come.
I also heard that Digital Eclipse sped this up because the original version was very slow to draw on the screen. Uh, I read that somewhere. Sorry, that was my dad's clock going off. <laughs> but yeah, let me know what you think about these early games. Uh, there is much more to come. So uh, this is one of the first ones that we can actually uh, play here. Awesome. And I want to show you too, you can go to the instruction manuals in these games. You can also change the screen mode to full or original. There's a filter with the TV and a curved TV, or you could turn that off. I like the TV at, actually. And you could turn the border off as well. All right, very cool. Centipede, while Jeff had seen screenshots of Atari Centipede, he never actually played it before creating his own version. While a ZX81 version looks like the original, it has some distinct differences. The ship cannot move up and down, and the centipedes fire bullets at the player. So he hadn't even played Centipede before, seen it, and he made this game. And it's it's very similar to Centipede, I'm kind of surprised. Uh, so here's the cartridge here, or the cassette. And let's play it. And it says, uh, for the Sinclair ZX81 in 1981, the complexity is one llama. It says, LlamaSoft's unofficial version of the classic arcade shooter in which you zap a lengthy centipede that breaks into segments. He created this as a homage, having seen screenshots of the arcade original, but without having actually played it himself, leading to some differences. The first ZX version of the new arcade game, Centipede. <laughs> this is amazing. I love this. Centipede is the greatest new idea since Space Invaders. Your base is being invaded by hostile, segmented aliens. The aliens are aimed to destroy you, and if they bomb you or you allow them to overrun your base camp, you lose a base. The aliens turn each time they encounter an obstacle. If shot in the middle, they break into two independent halves. You must shoot all segments before they land. Fire accurately, because if you uh, don't hit them, uh, you will merely deflect the aliens. So let's go ahead and press a key and start this one. Uh, so this one, of course, um, I think this one has no sound either. Um, your laser base is moved left and right by keys C and B. Now you don't have any keys in this. You're just using the controller. Um, break is disabled during the action, but operates okay during scoring. And here you set your parameters for the game, the speed, but 20 being slow and one being fast, the blitz. I would say somewhere in the middle is the best for most of us. So I'm going to try to choose a 10 down here and the control tip panel down here is very helpful how many bases i'm just going to say three and here we go all right so starting this up here uh definitely uh this is awesome i can't believe jeff had never seen centipede when he made this this is pretty accurate right um it's actually harder to get that last one than it looks. <laughs> there is auto firing too, I believe, in some of these games. So, yikes. Okay, so there's no way out of that right there. <laughs> you have two bases left. So, in the games with music, um, here in a bit, I will not be talking during the game that much because I don't want you to, um, I don't want to be drowned out by the music. I kind of had to put the volume at half level for this documentary because uh, this interactive documentary because I realized when I was looking back at the sound, it was too loud and there was some echoing. So I basically had to redo all of this footage and the commentary as well. So keep that in mind. But being a huge Jeff Mentor fan, it's a delight for me to go through this again. So, um, but I learned my mistakes from the audio on OBS. So shouldn't be having issues and the next one. Uh, and this is totally cleaned up. This does not have audio issues in it. Unless the music's too loud. And that I can't help. Because I have to make sure the documentary voices are loud enough to hear. So, And not too low. But definitely let me know what you think about this down below as I'm going through it. Um, I would love to hear it. Comment, like, and subscribe, of course, for chapter 2, 3, and 4. But you're coming up. Um, I think I'm going to air these every Sunday night until I am done. So... Uh, definitely be on the lookout for that around seven o'clock mountain standard time, which is 6 p.m. Pacific and 9 p.m. Eastern time here in the U.S. And Jeff, if you're watching, 
uh, you are freaking amazing. I love your work and what a great piece of video game uh, history and lore you are. I mean, just just amazing. Love all your stuff. So let's go ahead and go on to my next game. I'm gonna save my data. And let's get going here. All right, ZX Microfair. During the summer of 81, Jeff took a trip to London to the ZX Microfair, an early convention for the growing home computer market. He didn't go with the intent of starting a business, but after he showed Deflex, 3D, 3D, and Centipede to a small publisher called DKtronics, they offered right away to sell his games under their brand. So exciting. That is happenstance, right? <laughs> that happened. Mint reviews. I got chatting to the bloke on the stand that happened to mention that I'd written a couple of games for my own 4K RAM ZX81. I fished out a tape of the games on and we loaded them right there and then. To my utter amazement, he expressed an interest in actually buying some games off of me to sell, and right then and there he gave me one of the 16K RAM packs to work with. Wow. So here's a Cinebee cassette tape from the ZX81. Uh, the cassette label was used for later Llama Soft printings. Nice. All right. Peri uh, pericarditis. In the fall of 81, Jeff resumed his university studies at Oxford Polytechnic with a plan to major in computer science. But his higher education career was way late again, this time permanently. When he collapsed one morning after commuting to school, he was diagnosed with pericarditis, an inflammation of the lining of the heart and required complete rest for several months. As is the nature of such things, it was a lot more scary when I didn't know what was happening than it was once the correct diagnosis was made. Which isn't to say that it wasn't terrifying at times. Some nights I get a panic on and be sure I was going to snuff it imminently, which I would usually assuage by doing some programming. Programming was an excellent way to take your mind off scary thoughts and worries. Nice distraction there for the programming. Uh, Commodore VIC-20. Although it was more expensive than the Sinclair computers, the Commodore VIC-20 was still a low-cost computer but with fewer compromises. It had a full-size keyboard, color graphics, and sound. Its appealing features and low price made it the first home computer to sell over a million units. Very cool. A couple of weeks after the incident and my diagnosis, my mom took me into Basingstroke to go shopping. Not that I could actually do any shopping. I just sat in the car, too weak to even walk, the streets of Basingstroke. She returned to the car park with a VIC-20 package, which I lovingly cradled on my knees all the way home. What a great memory. Here's Deflex 5. The reason for the V in the title may be lost to time at this point, but Deflex 5 is a straightforward, simple version of the Ball and Paddles game for the VIC-20 platform. And I'm going to zoom into this cassette here. Very nice. And play it. So, for the VIC-20 and 81, a complexity of two llamas. An action puzzle game in which you drop paddles on the screen to reflect a ball towards a goal. Deflex 5 was based on a Commodore Pet game Jeff and his friends created. So here is the uh, instructions for this game. It's a dynamic game of skill. The aim is to demolish 15 targets, 1 through F, in the least time. Deflect the ball toward the target using bats on keys N and M. It says beware of placing too many. So we're going to choose our skill level here. I'm going to put it right in the middle on all these just to be safe. And uh, moving targets? No. <laughs> Not yet anyway. So um, I want to say I have played this before. This is my second time through the first part. So I'm obviously I'm much better at this than I was the first time. <laughs> so you want to hit these numbers by being reflected on them and later letters. And uh, pretty fun. It kind of reminds me of pinball or something uh obviously it's called deflect because you're deflecting off of these things but definitely a nice puzzle game and you can see the flashing colors in this which uh jeff mentor came to be known for his flashing strobing effects so this is one of the first games that have that and whenever you got too many on the screen you get an alert which is kind of scary uh let's go ahead and, and uh, get that up on the screen Excess bat misery. <laughs> Love it. So I played this a lot longer my first time make, uh, playing this. I'm going to make it a little shorter so we can move on. Awesome, guys. So I'm going to save this data. 
and go to the next one. All right. Rocks. With little else to do but rest and program, Jeff dove into the VIC-20, rapidly creating a few games. Soon he created an original game called Rocks, in which a lunar lander on the moon's surface had to shoot down incoming meteors. It proved to be quite fun, and Jeff and his father Patrick both played it a great deal that Christmas. And this definitely reminds me of Missile Command a little bit, or something. Notable and quotable, Christmas was rather a subdued affair that year, although I recall that Jeff was able to play Rocks, lying prone, using living room telly as a display. Patrick Mentor, Jeff's father. So cute. An auspicious day. My diary for the 21st March 82 contains the one word, llamas, from which I deduced that this was the day that Llamasoft was formed. Patrick Mentor, Jeff's father. Very cool. Llamasoft. Following a chance meeting with another resident of Tadley who was looking to get into the bourgeois and computer games business, Jeff decided to have a go at selling his games through his own company, rather than creating them as works for hire. Mentor views. It was after having paid seven quid for a version of Asteroid so mind-numbingly, gut-wrenchingly, and unremittingly awful as to beggar belief that I started thinking to myself, bloody hell, even I could do better than that, wondering if that was what I needed to do. So here's the Llama Soft logo. It was drawn in a Commodore VIC-20's graphic editor by Jeff. At first he drew the llama, then quickly came up with the name of the company. This is amazing. Love it. Of course we know that today. Early cover art, an example of the earliest Lombasoft game cover art, which took the form of a liner for a cassette tape case. Of course, you can see this was printed out by a dot matrix printer or whatnot at the time. I love it. All right, let's move on. A controversial beginning. A fast, prolific programmer, Jeff was able to get several games ready for the summer 82 launch of Llamasoft. These included Rocks, as well as a VIC-20 version of his 3D maze game, but also a new game in which players drop bombs from an aircraft onto a city. This was one of the many clones of the Commodore game Blitz, which itself had been inspired by Atari's game Canyon Bomber. This is a cool game. Falklands War. In April 82, Britain and Argentina had gone to war over a dispute concerning the Falkland Islands in the South Pacific. I was not particularly fond of the mess that then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher seemed to be getting us into, and I certainly didn't believe that it was worth anyone actually getting killed over on either side, Jeff recalled later. Bomb Buenos Aires. Feeling uneasy about the war, Jeff turned his bomber game into an explicit if sardonic political statement, tilting the game titling the game uh, Bomb Buenos Aires. The building sported Argentinian flags, and the game played Rule Britannia when the player was victorious. I guess I thought that it might get us noticed in a tasteless kind of way. And indeed it did, Jeff recalls. Definitely Canyon Bomber inspired, right? Bomber. Finding Lombasoft's humor to be in poor taste, many letters of complaint were written by those who had seen the game advertised in computer magazines, or written about it in the Daily Telegraph newspaper following its debut at a commoner show in June. Jeff quickly removed the real-life references and retitled the game. It has since been released as City Bomb, Bomber, and Blitzkrieg. And let's go ahead and play this one. Let's look at the cassette here. Different shade. Nice. And it says, this is for the Sinclair ZX Spectrum 82 with one llama complexity. Aerial bombing games inspired by the Atari arcade game Canyon Bomber were popular at the time, and City Bomb was Llama's take. Originally made as a sardonic political satire of the Falklands War between the UK and Argentina. So, uh, very nice. So I'm going to be quiet here because they're a sound of a game, uh, but let me know what you think. Very, very cool. All right. Very much Canyon Bomber inspired. I love that. So let's move on to the next thing here. Defenda. The game that would put Llamasoft on the map began as a clone of the Williams arcade machine, Defender. As was customary at the time, Llamasoft at first sold its unauthorized version by the same title before quickly changing it to the slightly less problematic Defenda. I can see him saying that in his, uh, in his uh, slang. Defenda. <laughs> I love that art. That's amazing. 
Mentor views. We needed some kind of magnum opus, something that would hopefully let us claim some kind of significance in the emerging biz. And back then, at the dawn of time, the way to do that was to produce a version of a popular arcade game and do it in machine code. Here's the Defenda manual that accompanied early copies of Defenda. Basically a sheet, I think. Very cool. Here's the Defenda cassette tape. And of course, they had simple homemade labels on these instead of the um, what we'd seen before. Interesting. All right, moving on. Llamasoft sells out. Llamasoft set up its first trade show booth at the Commodore Computer Show held from June 3 to 5, 1982 in Hammersmith, London. Handmade copies of Defenda on cassette tape sold out in the first day of the show, and Jeff's parents ending up having to hastily produce more copies that weekend. Love it. And I love this picture. Look at young Jeff Mentor. He's definitely a dude that we would hang out with at any time, right? <laughs> love it. Mentor views. It seemed that although Defenda was palpably cack, it was actually marginally less cack than some of the other games there, and so we sold tapes pretty much hand over fist the whole time. This was rather good. <laughs> I would say so. Here's the original Llamasoft ad. Likely the first magazine ad for Llamasoft is dates to June 82. The company's game library consisted of two titles, Defender and Bomb Buenos Aires, which could be ordered separately or on both sides of a cart for a cheaper price. Tracks, the early Llamasoft title tracks fell into the genre known as paint games. You had to cover every line on the screen in your spaceship without hitting the enemy ships patrolling the same grid of lines. Very cool, let's zoom in on this. Love that artwork. 81 skill levels, wow. Here's a tracks VIC-20 manual. The small instruction sheet was all players had to reference in playing tracks on the VIC-20. 83. Ratman, an action game in which the player had to whap falling rats with a hammer. Ratman was one of Jeff's first attempts at something approaching an original game. It was only advertised in a few Llamasoft mail order ads before being pulled from sale as Jeff wasn't happy with its quality. And I have to say, this art reminds me of a Nintendo Game & Watch game art or something. And I love, obviously Ratman is kind of similar to Batman. I love this, I wish I owned this. <laughs> Ratman, for the Vic-20 and 82 Complexity 1 Llama. Smash the falling rats with a hammer, but don't let them fall through the holes in the floor in this early Llama Soft action game. And this actually does remind me quite a bit of a Game Watch game. freaked out game from Llamasoft. I love it. So see what I mean? It looks a little bit like a Game & Watch game to a degree. Um, I love it. I love these rats too. They are <laughs> they're just falling on you. And you can't fall through the floor. I did not realize until a little bit later, but um, that's for the rats to fall through, I guess, and make things worse for you. So I'm going to whap them as soon as you can as well. Of course, with this being my second time playing this first chapter, I'm doing much better now. The first time I died pretty easily, and uh, I realized he, he does walk kind of clunkily, so I see what Jeff is talking about. So cool. You can see some, some early Jeff mentorisms uh, already appearing, right? The flashing and the, the visual stimuli, as he became known for, taking early shape. So now we have arrows that will pierce you, so different complexity for sure. Eek! Barely past that. Oh, I'm a goner. Ugh. And the hand of God descends upon you. Gotcha. <laughs> I bet your remaining men will soon be with me, the almighty God. <laughs> Love it. Showing you here the different screen modes and the filters. 
Very cool. And let's move on to the next. Ratman didn't look too bad by the standards of the day and featured a somewhat Monty Python-esque death scene where a long arm would appear from the top of the screen to snatch away an unsuccessful player, but it just didn't play very well no matter how much I tweaked it. He does walk a little sluggishly, but it's cool. Rat Trap ad, an early ad featuring Ratman dating to July 82, referred to by the early name Rat Trap. Here's the cassette tape for Ratman. <laughs> Love it. And let's move on. ZX Spectrum. Launched in April 82, the Spectrum was the successor to the ZX81 that added support for color graphics. This important upgrade made it a much more appealing platform for gaming, and the Spectrum became one of the most popular British gaming platforms of the 80s. Look at that. I respect the Spectrum for the positive impact it had on the British computer scene, and its programmers pulled off some prodigious feats of programming to ring games out of it that nobody else could have expected from such a comparatively primitive system. But it was not for me. I loved my Commodores. Rocks 3 Spectrum Version The more finely detailed graphics enabled by the Spectrum platform gave its version of Rocks a unique look. Let's take a look at this cassette and play this game. Nice. And it says, Rocks 3 Sinclair ZX Spectrum 82 1 Llama. Taking inspiration from multiple arcade games, Rocks 3 tasks the player with shooting down falling meteors before they impact on the lunar surface. And let's take a look at this. Very much giving me uh, Missile Command vibes already. Okay, and this one, basically you can shoot, I think, in two or three directions, uh, right, left, and maybe up. Um, from what I remember, I think I can just shoot right or left. But you have to time it kind of perfectly with the falling of these objects. I do much better in this gameplay sesh than I did in the past, so very cool. Ah, I just missed it. So I wanted to also say you got to play these games for yourself, guys. They are just much more thorough than I'm showing. Um, I'm not aiming for high scores. I'm just showing you a little bit of each game for time's sake so this doesn't go over an hour. But um, definitely really cool games here to play. Um, early Jeff Mentor games, I'm just I'm falling in love with these. They are so cool. Excellent. Here's the instruction manual, by the way. All right, let's move on here. Super Deflex, more than a mere port, Super Deflex on the Spectrum added a variety of new features, including a llama that walked across the screen to clean up, to clean up excess paddles. Uh, so, wow, I love that cover. And so I guess the first game with a llama, let's take a look. Sinclair ZX Spectrum in 82, two llamas. Exclusive to the Sinclair Spectrum, this updated version of Deflex added new features like a llama that walked across the screen to clear out paddles. Very cool. So we get our first taste of llamas here, or our second taste. Well, I was like seven when he put this out. Very neat. So I'm not going to play this one too much. It's essentially just like what we played before. By the way, um, I have a friend online here, Jennifer, on <laughs> my Switch. Hi, Jennifer. Um, very cool. So what I'm going to try to do here is basically just show you the llama walking across the screen. This one does seem a little more clunky to me. Maybe it's the graphics that are updated or whatnot from the last version. But I essentially want to show you the llama clearing out the paddle. So I'm going to create some extra paddles here. And here he is. And I know we have another video coming up um, here pretty soon. Let's see if I can get at least one of these. Ah, so tough. <laughs> All right. 
Let's go ahead and move on here. Super Deflex. Cassette tape. Here's a cassette tape for Super Deflex. Nice. All right. Independence Day. While Amasoft was beginning to pick up in sales and recognition, Jeff's relationship with his business partners had soured. He was only entitled to 30% of the earnings from his games. With the backing of his parents, Hazel and Patrick, Jeff was able to break from the partnership, going forward independently while retaining the Lamasoft name. Thankfully, right? Andy's Attack. Defendo was selling well, and an American game publisher called HESWare wanted to release it, retitling it Aggressor. Jeff took this opportunity to switch things around for the UK market as well, replacing the human characters with llamas and retitling the game Andy's Attack. This was the first chance the US audience had to get to know the name Jeff Mentor. And let's zoom in on this cassette. Look at this gorgeous artwork, I love that. And play the game. So uh, it says here, Commodore VIC-20, 82, Complexity 2 Llamas. Originally released as Defenda, a thinly veiled clone of a popular arcade game, the revised Andy's Attack marked the beginning of Lombasoft's series of games starring Jeff Minter's favorite animals. Flying over the Andes Mountains in Peru, the player must stop aliens from abducting llamas. And with there being sound in this, I won't talk too much on this one, but look at this, just so... Just like Defender, right? Love it. And let's go ahead and look at the instruction manual here that came in this. It's got 10 levels. Very cool. Mount Pleasant and Tadley. So moving on here, let's go ahead and take a look at what's coming up next. Lombasoft the early days. Lombasoft evolved alongside the personal computer in Britain. Jeff recounts the earliest days of the company from getting his first ZX80 to the early success of Andy's attack. Let's play this awesome video to close out this chapter. <laughs> when I was in school, I dabbled in lots of various things. I got a skateboard, I was a skater for a while, really enjoyed that. I wasn't even aware of the link between computers and video games, really. And it's only because I walked into this room one day in college, and there's one guy sat down the end with this weird thing which looked like a, a telly on top of a typewriter keyboard. He appeared to be playing some kind of crude game on it, and I went and was a bit curious, went over and asked him, where did that game come from? And he said he types it in. That was, that was the moment that completely changed my life. I really enjoyed the act of programming. I, I thought that I'd finally found something that I actually had some kind of genuine aptitude for. But out of the whole sixth form college, we only had one machine, which was a Commodore PET. And officially, you had to be like book up half hour slots. You could have one half hour slot a day, and that wasn't really enough time for me to get stuff done. I mean, the thing is, back then, the Commodore PET was quite expensive. And I didn't come from a rich family. There was no way I, that our family could have afforded a computer, and there's no way I individually could afford a computer. I didn't, I only had pocket money at the time, didn't have a job. Um, and then and this item came on the news and showed a client Sinclair demonstrating the prototype of the ZX80 in some school somewhere. And the idea of actually having your own computer at home was unbelievable. I really, really, really wanted that ZX80. And so eventually got the money together and ordered it. It actually arrived on the same day as my A level results. And I'm um, just forgetting all about my other results and tearing open the box from Sinclair and spending the rest of the day sat in front of my ZX80, having a wonderful time. The availability of, of, of these machines cheap is what really kick-started the, the software industry because when other people started having these machines, they wanted software for them. And in fact, that's how I got started, really. I went up to a ZX Micro Fair. Uh, I had some tapes with some of my simple games I'd done on them. And I got talking to this one guy on the stand for a company called DK Tronics. And I showed them some stuff and they said, well, perhaps we could sell it. And I said, that's fantastic. And uh, so I ended up doing some ZX81 programs for them. 
Nothing caught hold of me the way that programming did. I mean, it was just such a powerful thing. I just wanted to do it all the time. I was actually working quite a heavy schedule. And at the time, I was going to Oxford Polytechnic. Um, I was commuting to Oxford from Tadley, which involved like a, a seven mile bike ride to the train station, get on the train, another couple of miles, and I'm up a very steep hill to get to the Polytechnic. All day at Polytechnic, back home. And then I was coming back and I was spending my evening hours working on this stuff for DK Tronics. Uh, and then one day I at Polytechnic, so I just suddenly felt really, really weak and really sick. And I had like tunnel vision. Then it was obvious that some shit was not right. And they found out I had some condition called pericarditis, which is where it's an inflammation of the lining of the heart and the heart rubs against it and becomes distressed. And uh, that took me six or seven months to recover from that. It made me very weak for quite a long period of time. I, mean, I had to have a lot of rest, and one of the things I could do while incapacitated that way, well, I could still do my programming. I mean, while I was ill, that's when I did some of the work which led to my first Llamasoft games. Llamasoft was formed originally as a partnership between me and these other guys. I'd be hanging out with this son of a guy who owned the local video store in Tadley and him and his dad, they said, why don't we form a company together and, and sell some of your games? Oh, uh, you've been ill, you know, you've got to look after yourself. We'll look after all the business stuff. And we started doing stuff together. When we first started out, I was doing what everybody else was doing, just copying arcade games. On the VIC-20, I did this game called Defender with an A on the end, because that's how everybody used to avoid copyright back then, so they thought. And then Atari started throwing their weight around and threatening people. We thought we'd better at least, at least make it so it doesn't say Defender anymore. So we changed the name of the game to Andy's Attack. Andy's as in the mountain range. Instead of rescuing humans, you rescue little llamas. It was a pretty crappy version. A chunky character-based scroll and the ship was the size of a bus and handled about as well. These other guys who had a big deal of us, they wanted to have 70%. I thought, naively thought, oh, well, maybe that's a good deal. I don't fucking know. And I mentioned this to my mum. My mum was like, absolutely no way was this going to happen. And she met, insisted on meeting up with these people, and it was like, it's going to be 50 50 or not at all. But it became apparent they weren't going to negotiate. They wanted to have 70%. So we ended up splitting quite acrimoniously. <laughs> and Lamasov became. Basically, our family business, we've uh, started out with me and being my mum. My mum doing a lot of the admin sort of business side of things and me just doing all the programming. Awesome guys, that's essentially the end of chapter one. Let's read this last part here. Low liftoff. As 82 came to a close, Jeff Mentor had found his calling. He was an independent game designer who had forged his own path in this novel industry. Before the year was out, he would release his first massive hit. Looks like Grid Runner over there. That's one of my favorite games of his, so excited to go into that. Let's, let's go ahead and look at part two, which will be next time. A string of hits, the exploding popularity of computer games in the UK and a wide open playing field for software entrepreneurs was a massive window of opportunity for a talented, prolific designer like Jeff Mentor. Lamasoft was about to hit its stride. So just wanted to show you here, there is a game library as well you can go through. Um, let's start at the beginning. So this includes all the games uh, on this compilation here. There might be some unlockables, like we had in Atari 50. Um, so uh, very cool. So excited to play the rest of these games. Here's Grid Runner. Attack of the Mutant Camels, what a classic. So awesome games here. These are coming up and the rest of the compilation. We'll be playing these in the future. Hover Bubber, can't wait to play it. Revenge of the Mutant Camels, Hellgate, Sheep in Space, Attack of the Mutant Camels, Meta Llamas, and Ancipital, Hover Bubber, Psychedelia, Mama Llama, Color Space, Iridus Alpha, all these cool games coming up. Void Runner, Super Grid Runner, Attack of the Mutant Camels, Llamatron, Tempest 2000, and Grid Runner Remastered, which uh, is which is made by Digital Eclipse just for this compilation. So let's go ahead and look at the gameography. Now in this, you can take a look at all of the Jeff Mentor games 
not all included here of course um, but he navigated the turbulent game industry for over four years embracing evolving technologies while staying true to his own philosophy of game creation very cool so we're going through all these here the first being deflex all the way down to um, Aka R, I believe, which you were talking with Atari. So, uh, very cool. So, let's go ahead and look at these here. Looks like a total of 62 games, which is incredible. Wow. All kinds of cool stuff. Excellent. All right. And uh, so, as I said, next time we'll take a look at the Harry years. So,. I'm gonna go ahead and see what the option screen says. Let's look at the credits. Let to give these guys some notoriety that made this awesome uh, documentary. An interactive documentary, I should say. So I wanted to say while we're seeing the credits here, um, thank you so much for watching. Um, I am just, I'm a huge Jeff Mentor fan, so I've covered him quite a bit on my channel. Um, there is a Heart of Neon documentary also coming out soon. There are clips of that uh, within this. Um, interactive documentary of course i interviewed the director of that paul doherty um on that atari show and uh also the uh, musician for the project tony longworth who's a friend of mine now and um <clears throat> he makes the music for atari newsline and some of my other shows on my channel well he made the songs already i chose them with his permission and so and uh every time you watch a video of mine and his music's playing he gets credited for that <clears throat> And I'm just glad to do that. He's a great musician and a really cool guy. Check out my Christmas special as well that aired last December 2023. So um, definitely looking forward to part two of this. Now, I have not gone beyond this, so I'm playing this along with you. Except for this first part, I had some audio issues of echoing with my video. So I had to redo the whole thing pretty much within a couple of hours today. So on Sunday, March 24th, 2024, but I just wanted to let you know, um, this game was given to me to review by digital clips, um, a free copy. They did not tell me what to say. They did not give me any points to talk about. Um, and it just goes to show what a great company they are. They, they're, they just have confidence in their games and their documentaries, and this is just incredible. So, so far, I have to give this an A+. It's just fantastic. And it only costs $29.99. That's like $10 back in the 80s. I mean, that's just, that's unheard of. What a great value for all these games. I think there are over 40 games in this collection. So it says, thank you for playing Lombasoft, the Jeff Mentor story. At Digital Clips, we believe classic games are the foundational art on which the industry was built and deserve a higher class of treatment and preservation. The Goldmaster series, curated and published by Digital Clips, preserves and authentically restores landmark titles from gaming's history while celebrating the accomplishments of legendary designers, teams, and studios. Our interactive documentary format brings archival materials, interview videos, playable games, and more into a single cohesive, chronological, and contextual experience the video game equivalent of a documentary film. We hope you enjoyed this new approach to archival game releases and hope you look forward to future installments in the Gold Master series from Digital Eclipse. I definitely do. I'm going to have to get that Karateka collection now. <laughs> Just amazing. So I am stoked about this. Of course, you can change the language, the audio volume. There's menu music and menu music mode. There are different songs and mixes you can play. Really cool. I'm going to play some of these for you now. Okay, I'm going to go through this licenses part here at the end, but um, as we close out, I uh, just wanted to say again, thanks for watching No Filter HD. This has been Ballistic Coffee Boy here, uh, your host. Um, on No Filter HD, I typically play any kind of Atari game, so whether that's on Nintendo Switch or a VCS or whatever, even the Xbox, I'll play it for you. So this one obviously is on the Nintendo Switch. Um, there is no Atari VCS version planned or in development. I reached out to Digital Clips about this on their Twitter and heard back that these, uh, th this game along with others were created quite a while ago. You know, you have to work on them for a while to be this great. 
and they had said there wasn't a version planned at the time for the VCS. Of course, since then, Atari has purchased digital clips, so now they're a part of Atari. Um, I would assume, though, going forward in the future, after maybe the next couple of releases, that we might see some of these on the VCS or um, other consoles, too. So this version here, uh, this uh, Jeff Mentor story, is on pretty much every major console, so you can get it on the PS5 and PS4. The Switch, obviously, which I'm playing on here, Xbox, um, PC, and Steam, and others. So, uh, just so cool. So, um, I just wanted to say how profoundly impacted I am by this documentary. I love this. Jeff Minter is a fantastic developer who never got his his uh, fair shake, really. And uh, but just amazing, uh, all the stuff he's created. He's worked on every platform pretty much. Put out stuff even for iOS. Um, and just like mobile platforms, he put out stuff on the PS Vita. Um, uh, pretty much every console you could think of, right? Um, Atari Jaguar, the Atari Apic Computers, the Commodore, the Vic, the Spectrum. The list goes on. So um, I am stoked. So next time we'll take a look at uh, part two or chapter two, the Harry Years. And um, I'm excited to bring that to you. Make sure to subscribe, like, and comment for the next installment. And uh, I will see you guys next time for the Harry Years. Thank you so much for watching Llama Soft, the Jeff Mentor story here on No Filter HD. Thank you so much, guys. Have a great one. Ballistic Coffee Boy here, signing off. See you next time. You are watching Ballistic Hockey Radio.